news, everyone. <laughs> We're starting off the year right. <laughs> um, let me know if that worked. <laughs> Thank you. I see a thumbs up. So funny. I try to do everything right, and I still make mistakes. Oh, my goodness. So today's live stream to start off the year is going to be what does it cost to set up a reef tank? So if your spouses are nearby and you don't want them to know, you should send them to the mall with your credit card right now. If your uh, kids are going to rat you out, you know, tell them to go play, a, a, get on their PlayStation or whatever, <laughs> and get them away from listening. Because if they, oh, ah, I'm just telling you because I want to be up front with you. Thank you so much for letting me everyone, uh, letting everyone know, or letting me know that there was no sound. I would have gone on for 10 minutes. <laughs> All right. Everyone, uh, it's a brand new year. It's 2019. We survived 2018. We're heading into the new year. I definitely want to know what your plans are. Feel free to put them in the comments under this video if you're watching it later. Uh, I would love to hear your goals. If you haven't had a chance to do it yet, you can always post them in Club Milo's Reef. Does that come on the screen? No? Yes? So we have a group on Facebook, and you're welcome to join. Uh, there's uh, over 3,000 people in there, and we're there to help each other. And I'm telling you guys, if you're being mean in there, if you're berating others, if you're putting them down, your posts are going to get deleted, and you could be deleted too. <laughs> we basically want to just be helpful, just like this channel is helpful. And I want you guys to feel welcome and safe and feel like you can talk about, you know, whatever's on your mind. You know, even when I have a question, I want to be able to ask and not have people put me down for asking. So I want the exact same kindness given to you. So enough about that. Uh, I should put this on the screen. I run milosreef.com. My name is Mark Levinson. Those are the initials of my name. That's where Milov came from. And so if you're new to the channel and there's always new people, you know, just introducing myself. The channel is educational, but the website is where all the education came from in the first place. And it's how I sell things and make money to pay the bills. So I would like to thank you all for those of you that choose to go to the website to buy things to uh, not only support your aquarium, but support me, a YouTuber and a, uh, you know, a businessman. So thank you very much for that. So in this video's description, I'm hoping a link appeared. I pasted it in there, but I'm using this streaming software and I'm not positive if that uh, software will uh, give you a link you can click on or if you have to copy it and paste it. But the topic itself is called, what does it cost to set up a saltwater aquarium? And a long time ago, I kept hearing the price tag, $25 a gallon, and it made no sense to me. And I kept thinking, where did this number come from? What, how did they come up with that? So what I did, and I wrote an article about this, and this article is pretty old. Let's see, I wrote it in 2010, so eight years ago. And in this article, I go into all the different parts of what I would use to set up a reef tank. And I'm just going to save you some time for those of you who want to jump off the stream and go live your life. I say it's $47 a gallon. And you may say, oh my God, that's a lot of money. But you know what? It's pretty accurate. And it really comes down to how you want to spend your money and what kind of gear you buy. And I feel like if you're trying to buy quality gear that's going to last you a long time, it's basically going to be $47 a gallon before you add any livestock, before you've even added water. So here's a kind of the breakdown today. I, and like I said, this article is eight years old, but the information, it, it, the stuff I talk about tends to be valid forever. It's very rare you'll find me talk about something that no longer applies. And I used to do a podcast many years ago. And in that podcast, we talked about all kinds of stuff. And, you know, that was from 2006 to 2009. That's a decade ago. <laughs> wow, it really is. And when I would hear those podcasts come up on iTunes from time to time when my rotation lands on them, I'd start laughing and I remember the good old days and I'd listen to the topic and I'm like, wow, this still applies. It's still accurate. So let's just uh, get into it. If you buy an aquarium, you know, a glass box or an acrylic box, believe it or not, that's about the cheapest part of the entire project. And it's kind of a funny ongoing joke. You know, people say, oh, I bought this tank. And, you know, we all nod along. We're like, we're happy for you. And at the same time, we're feeling a little bit bad for you because that is a lot of money. And now it is going to keep spending and spending and spending. Hey, I want to thank you for your super chat. That was very nice of you. Let's see if I can slide this onto the screen for a second. And it's in pounds. 
So I have no idea <laughs> what that's worth, but I appreciate it. Way to go. So I'm pounding you back, get it? <laughs> uh, so you've got your glass box. Now we got to pick a size that's going to fit your home that's going to fit in your area. Let's say we're putting one right here behind my desk. I would probably put something that's about the size of a 29 gallon here. But if you have a living room and you have a lot of space, you can turn around and you can do something even more special and larger and hopefully deeper. And deeper means front to back. I'm going to drop this in here too because you guys are being generous today. Thank you very much, Shane. I appreciate that. You're being awesome today. Thank you. We're going to keep doing that until people say stop doing that because I'm probably too old to do that. But my son might approve. Once you've figured out the gallon size you like that will fit in your home, and one of the best ways to do that is to mark off the area with some, I like, I like to use the blue masking tape. And you can actually put the outline and stand back and, and walk up to it and kind of envision it. And another thing you could do is take a cardboard box about the size of the aquarium and put it in that place too. So you've got your aquarium. Now you need a stand. You might need a canopy uh, if you want them to match. And you're going to have to have electrical for that area to support the tank. And what's important is that you don't have just one circuit. If you have one set of plugs on this wall and you're thinking, oh, I can plug an aquarium into that, just wait till you buy all your gear and you have 18 plugs to plug into two outlets in the wall. So I really like to recommend wherever you're setting up a tank, if possible, use two circuits. So that may require you to hire an electrician. There is a little bit more money you're spending on your glass box that was so inexpensive. But that's part of the price. Now, what does it cost to putting another circuit into your home? Uh, that could vary. And maybe it's something you can do yourself, or maybe it's some, someone you know is an electrician will give you a, a great deal. But I saw a guy driving down his little pickup truck, not far from my house, about a mile away, and I saw his phone number on the back of his truck. And I took a picture with my phone really quick of his number, so while I was driving, I could, you know, get that number because I couldn't memorize it. So I called him up as soon as I got home and said, hey, I need to put this one circuit in. And the guy came out, he looked at where my breaker panel was, he knew he had to run a wire through the attic and come down the wall and put a new outlet there. And it was $90. Now maybe I got a heck of a deal, maybe that's the normal price, maybe it'll cost you more or less, I don't know. If you could run the wire yourself from the breaker panel to you know the spot in the wall and then have the electrician connected to both ends, that'll save you money because he doesn't have to crawl through an attic. But th this is just me recommending what I would do to set up a reef tank properly. Everything I'm describing today, I bet you there are people that can do it cheaper and save money. And that is not to put them down at all. I, I totally get that. I'm all about saving money. Anytime I can save money, I'm a huge fan of that. And it's one of the things I, I try to attempt to do all the time. But, you know, some people aren't comfortable working with electricity and they don't want anything to do with that. And so I'm recommending you hire someone that is legally um, endorsed and is going to safely do the job so your house doesn't burn down. <laughs> so let's not, you know, rule that out. Okay, uh, the next thing we want to do is we've got our stand, our tank, our canopy, which I think a canopy is nice. A lot of you are, these days are buying rimless aquariums that don't even have a canopy. You like that sleek, clean, modern look which means you need to have a nice light fixture above it. You can't just rig whatever because it'll be hideous and you can't hide it in a canopy. So maybe the canopy is a good idea. <laughs> now, if you are trying to pick a light fixture, you will find some that cost $100 and you're gonna find some that cost $800. So right there is part of that price tag I'm describing at $47 a gallon. And uh, just to bring you up to speed, you know, because you might think, oh, that's whatever. A 100-gallon tank would be $4,700 to set up, okay? So a 10-gallon tank would be $470 to set up. Can you do it less? Yes, like I mentioned. And the first way, I'm gonna jump right into that really quick. The first way to save money is to buy someone's used equipment. So if you're on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace or um, I don't know, some other way of seeing ads and you find things sold half price and you can buy it from someone leaving the hobby, that just cut your 47 in half, right? Maybe even better. You know, you might have acquired all kinds of goodies uh, for the amount of money you're paying. And in that case, you know, that's great, depending on the age and the condition of everything you bought. And some people will take it a step further. They will keep buying used setups left and right from people, 
And then whatever they don't need, they will then flip that on Craigslist or on Facebook Marketplace, you know, in, in saltwater groups and forums, trying to sell off things that they'll never use. Like, for example, they might already have a protein skimmer and they bought a used setup with a skimmer they will never need. And so they sell that skimmer to make some money really quick to help pay for a light fixture they want to buy that hangs above the tank. So there is those kind of things to keep in mind as well. But it, it's, a, it's a lot of extra work. You know, versus I'm going to go to Amazon, I'm going to buy this, and it's going to be here tomorrow, <laughs> which is awesome. Now, if you could buy everything you need for your aquarium online, you'll save some money versus buying everything you need at the fish store. But the fish store is there to help you when your tank goes wrong. And I can't undersell uh, that point. That is a really important point. So if you are going to buy everything online, then I'm going to ask you to respectfully not go into the fish store to do all your homework and ask all your questions and then give them no dollars. That's really unfortunate. Uh, it's a horrible stigma. And we are hurting our own industry by doing that. So if you want to go in and learn about something, then you should be going in there with a desire that you will probably buy something from them that day as a thank you for the knowledge they gave you. Just like when you go to my YouTube channel and you learn things and then you go make decisions, it didn't cost you anything, right? And you got to do it for free for the most part. When we walk into a fish store and ask them everything about a protein skimmer and they sell it right there on the shelf and then you say thank you and you leave and you go buy it on Amazon or elsewhere for you know 20 bucks, 50 bucks less, it hurts the store. The store can't stay open when people aren't buying things. And if, you're, if your attitude is, oh, well, let some other sucker buy it, it's not good for the economy, okay? So I know some of the things I described today are not going to be very popular. And that's okay. I can live with that because these are the thoughts in my own head. I'm not dreaming up some insanity just to drive you guys crazy. I'm just being realistic with you. And, you know, we have to take care of each other. We have to be good to each other. So your next thing that you need to buy is going to be a protein skimmer. And you're going to need to buy some kind of a sump, I would recommend, <laughs> because I love tanks with sumps. And the reason I like a sump underneath the aquarium is because all the water drains down and all the filtration is happening down beneath out of sight. See, my hands are out of sight. And all the magic's happening down there. And yet the display area is beautiful without a lot of equipment in there to obscure it or to interrupt the beauty of the corals and fish. So a sump, I would recommend. Um, I also would recommend to have a refugium zone, which is an area for macroalgae to grow in. So that's another expense. So we've got tank stand, lights, sump, refugium, which could be combined, uh, protein skimmer. Now you need a return pump. You're going to need two heaters, not one. And I recommend three watts per gallon. So if it's a 100 gallon tank, you need 300 watts of heat. And since I want you to have two heaters, you get two 150 watt heaters. So you're gonna take your three watts per gallon, get the total amount you need, divide it in half by two heaters that size. And that way, if one heater were to stick on, it can't cook your tank. You're gonna need all the test kits. So that means alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, phosphate, nitrate. If you're starting a tank from scratch, you need ammonia, nitrite. Um, those are the test kits you need to buy. You'll need to measure salinity. So you need a refractometer or you need a hydrometer at the very least. Uh, you're gonna need to know the tank temperature. So you need a thermometer or two because you might break one. <laughs> Fortunately, the thermometers are cheap, like $3 each. But you wanna have a few thermometers on hand. You're gonna put one in the tank and you're gonna put one inside your barrel of salt water you're mixing up for a water change. And to make water, you need an RODI system. And what else are you gonna need? Uh, you're going to need power strips of some kind to plug these 18 plugs into. So you want to find something that's safe, uh, something that can trip in the event of a, a, a surge. Uh, I'd lean toward getting something with a battery backup in it for the absolute essentials, which might be just your return pump. So that way the power keeps going on. I mean, the flow keeps happening in the tank while the power is out temporarily. You know, it can hold you over for a few minutes or a couple of hours if you're lucky, depending on the size of the return pump and how much power it draws. And of course, you're going to need PVC plumbing, 
which that's another funny thing. We, we go in thinking, oh, I just need a little bit of pipe and a couple of fittings, and you walk out and it's $64. <laughs> and you're like, the pipe was $2, and it's 10 feet long, but all those little fittings, they're like a buck a piece, and you end up needing like 97 little, little pieces, and you're puzzling it all together. And if you've never worked with plumbing before, you're going to need the tools to cut the PVC pipe. You're going to need the glue and the solvent. Um, you're going to need a tape measure. Um, I'm trying to see what else is on my list of things that you would need. I definitely like a pH meter versus a uh, pH test kit. I, I just, I can't stand pH test kits. They're horrible. So you want a meter. And the one I really like is the American Pinpoint. And that is one where you put in a 9 volt battery and you put the probe in the water and it tells you on the display 8.123, or I'm sorry, 8.12 or 8.23 or... 8.3 point, I keep saying all the extra points, 8.4. But it's nice to know exactly what the pH is the moment you look. And pH changes throughout the day and the night. And so having a meter where you can measure it any time, day or night, you can track those trends. And if you want to go a step further, you buy a controller like the Apex. And the Apex EL is $500. The Apex uh, 2016, which is the full version, is $800. But then you've got a bunch of places to plug things in. You've got several probes to measure water parameters. You've got the ability to turn things on and off with your phone or your computer. You have the ability to get text notifications when things go wrong. Um, and uh, you can program it to disable certain things based on certain parameters. For example, on my tank, if my tank were to get too warm, my apex will turn off the lighting to stop adding heat because I run metal halides. If you have a problem and the tank gets too cold, it can send you a text and say it's too cold. If, you're, uh, if you want a feed timer or if you want to have a, a simplified method of water changes, you can basically code that programming in the uh, Apex to turn things off temporarily and then resume them automatically so you don't forget to turn them back on yourself. So there's that. Now, that are, those are the basics. And then the other things that I feel are important to have and some of these I don't even own, but they're still important to have, especially for someone newer to the hobby or someone that is not able to stay with their tank on a regular basis. You know, they're traveling a lot. And uh, so it really has to be on autopilot. You may decide you need a chiller for your tank to keep the tank temperature right and keep it from getting overheated. You may want to get a quarantine tank, which means room for another aquarium in your home to put the brand new fish in that you bought and let them stay in there for three weeks for observation, feeding, uh, and to maybe medicate if there's a problem. And if they have to be medicated, basically they come out of the quarantine and they go into the hospital tanks. Now I've got you to get three tanks instead of just one. But the first time you put a sick fish in your tank and all your fish get sick and all your fish die or most of them die, you will start thinking quarantining and hospital tanks don't sound like such a bad idea after all. Uh, I also like the calcium reactor, but you may decide, no, no, I'm not going that crazy, Mark. I just want to mix my own products. I want to mix up alkaline and calcium, or I'm going to buy it in liquid form, and I'll pour it in by hand. And then after a while, you're just like, okay, I'm tired of pouring this in by hand. I want a dosing pump. And so you buy yourself a really fancy dosing pump, and that's another three, four, five hundred dollars $500. And it will then trickle in the right amount of each solution multiple times a day automatically and your job is to make sure that the liquid comes out it comes out of the right amount and that the liquid is being replenished as it gets used up and needs to go in there and finally we need to have sand for the aquarium because a tank with no sand is ugly <laughs> i really do hate that uh it just it's not a museum piece it is a living uh, biotope and when I go diving and I'm in the ocean, I see rock and sand. I don't see a glass bottom. <laughs> so I just can't recommend a, a, a bare bottom tank. I, I love a tank with sand. We need rock in the tank. That's going to cost money too, right? And then you're going to need salt to mix your salt water. And you've got to buy bags or buckets or, or bigger of salt to mix up. You'll need a circulation pump to mix the salt water. You'll need the barrel itself to mix the salt water in. And uh, we're going to need pumps and hose. Well, that, that circulation pump can be used to, with some hose 
to pump from the barrel into your aquarium during a water change. You also need to drain water out of your aquarium, so you're going to need some equipment for that. And then I would like to see you have some kind of a reactor or two. And one would be for carbon. Um, a lot of people love GFO, which is granular ferric oxide. And that is a product used to remove phosphate from the water. It binds it to the metal. But if you don't want to go that route, then you don't have to. And you can just use Phosphate RX like I do. And you're going to need um, the actual carbon, the GFO, uh, bio pellets, you know, the things you put in the reactor. So those are kind of all your expenses. And we never even got to fish and corals, the best part of all. But that's how you come up to $47 a gallon. So there you go. What are your thoughts? I should have read all these comments, but it's really hard to do that and stay on topic. I've been watching some other live streams to see how people do it. And I feel like th what they're mostly doing is reading the conversation and they're just talking back and forth where I tend to have a topic. And that's just how I am. I, I don't mean to dominate the conversation, but at the same time, I want to get out some basic knowledge that will help you. And some of you have said you're listening to this while you're working on your tank. Uh, others have said while you're driving to work. And some are literally just tuning in and watching the screen, and that's awesome. I appreciate that. So I'm going to scroll up here for a minute and see what I missed. And I'm going to skip the whole part about there's no volume. <laughs> what a mistake. Okay, there's a lot of no sound. That's so hilarious. <laughs> okay, I gotta put this on the screen. That is so funny. And his name is Just a Bubble Tip. I read his lips and he said he was going to give me his reef tank. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> all right, all right, all righty. Let's see. I'm trying to get to the conversation. Okay, here we go. Reef tanks are only cost as much as you want to, to do it. I've done systems from eBay and I've done systems from the most expensive manufacturers. And that is correct. You can make this project as expensive as you want or you can make it as economical as you possibly can. And for example, if you could build all your own things, if you could build the glass box and build the sump and build the reactors and you know, run your own electricity and you know, fabricate your own stand, you'll save a lot of money. And that's awesome. If you're not able to do those things, you know what you could do? You could start to learn. And as you learn to do those things, you could in fact uh, become more adept at more things than before you started. And that's, you know, we kind of joke that when you get in this hobby, you, you know, you want to have saltwater fish and corals. And then next thing you know, you become a plumber and you become an electrician and you become a photographer and you become a blogger. <laughs> and you become a YouTuber, <laughs> there, you have all these new jobs that you never even considered that would be part of your life. All right. while I'm scrolling through here and trying to read your comments. I do want to mention that I've already cleaned both of my protein skimmers today and I've got all my test kits out so I'm ready for water test Saturday. So, you know, all last year I asked you guys every Saturday to please test your water today and, you know, find out your parameters, make adjustments, post those parameters to help others. This year I want you to test your water and clean your skimmer. <laughs> it's going to be a new task for the year. And then who knows, next year I might ask you to do something crazy on top of those two things. But cleaning your protein skimmer out is really important because if you do not uh, clean it and you say I'll get to it later, invariably it overflows and puts all that crap back into the water. Or, or worse, it overflows and makes a mess everywhere you have to really clean up. So it's much better to remove that collection cup now, clean it thoroughly, clean the inside of the neck, put it back on the body of the skimmer and you know, start the week fresh. So I'm recommending you do that the same day you're testing your water. Hey, thanks for letting me know that link worked. That's cool. I wasn't sure because in the stream, you know, I, 
I'm looking at this with some different software. I'm not in the regular window, and I didn't know if it would become a hyperlink or not. So thank you for that. Um. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Dan Mo, you, you made me laugh here. I'm closer to $220 per gallon on my 90. <laughs> you know, it is possible to spend a small fortune on this hobby. Uh, let's see. Okay, uh, this was a question asking about, is this the maintenance cost? I'm talking about only setting up a tank. People often ask me, what does it cost to maintain my tank? I have a 400 gallon reef and you know, I've got a 60 gallon anemone cube. They're tied together. So I have a 450 gallon system. And I probably spend about $200 a month on the tank itself in various ways, whether it's to buy more test kits or buy fish food, pick up the occasional coral that I can't say no to. Um, I rarely buy new fish and one of the reasons is because fish are finicky and you can get a new fish and you put it in the tank and then it fights with all the other fish or like I talked about before there could be a disease that comes in and affect all your healthy fish and I don't like to rock that boat I kind of want to leave it alone and you know limit the the risk but of course using quarantine methods is a good way to eliminate that possibility. It's just one more thing to do. And so it's not on the top of my list to get new fish. I, I tend to look at them at the fish store. I enjoy that, but I don't uh, very often buy them. Uh, okay, Matt says here, he does a lot of DIY, which is what I was talking about before. And uh, his 125 gallon hasn't cost him close to that. You know, Look at that. He thinks he's only spent about $2,000 in his setup. That's fantastic. Very good, excellent. Here's a good question. So we're gonna, we're gonna start hitting your questions here. Does anyone put foam under their framed glass aquarium and how thick should it be for 120 gallon? The one thing I would tell you, Brian, that's very important is to contact the manufacturer that made the tank and ask them what do they recommend goes under it? Because my last aquarium was a glass aquarium and I contacted the manufacturer who was up in Canada and he said, you want to have um, a sheet of foam. And he said, of course you'd want a sheet of foam under it. <laughs> I was like, of course. <laughs> I mean, you know, the thing is I bought that tank used with a steel stand and it was running. And the guy said, you got to put it on foam. And I said, well, I'm buying it uh, sitting on the steel stand that you made. It's, you know, you sold him the stand in the tank. And his reply, you know, it really kind of shocked me. He said, well, you can kiss that tank goodbye. <laughs> I thought I literally just bought this thing. I haven't even picked it up yet and I'm finding this out. And so that was terrifying. But at the same time, it ended up being just fine. I, mean, I enjoyed that tank for six years before I finally kissed it goodbye uh, when it decided to leak at the top corner. But he recommended foam. Then I got the Marineland 400 gallon tank and I asked them, what do you want to put it on? And they said, we recommend that it sit on, um, on plywood. And they wanted me to buy their stand, but I didn't like it. And I said, I'm going to use a steel stand. And they said, well, you got to put plywood on top. And so no foam on that one. So that's why you need to know what the manufacturer recommends rather than just going with what popular opinion is, because the people that built the tank, they know the best. I mean, God, if they don't know the best, then who are you going to turn to? So that would be my recommendation. Oh, hello, Belgium. <laughs> uh, I see Mike B's head exploded when I told him I got an electrician for $90. Uh, he was an older man. Maybe he didn't need the money. Super nice guy, though. This right here is a question I can't really answer because it comes totally down to what you want to buy. Now, I want to mention this, you know, because, you know, when it comes to livestock is what I'm talking about. If you say, well, I want, you know, a peppermint angel, which, first of all, you can't get very easily. Uh, it's $10,000 <laughs> for that one fish. Um, or you might say, I want these crazy high-end corals where someone else would say, oh, I'm happy with zinnia and mushrooms, which cost five or $10 a frag. So it's really hard to give you an estimate on what it would cost with livestock per gallon. 
based on what's inside the aquarium. But uh, I wanted to, I, I had a thought and I lost it. Anyway, my predictions here are gonna be more based on the equipment that would, long, that would last longevity wise, that would be long term. Okay, let's talk about this one. Microbubbles, can we talk about that? If you take, you know, you say it's in your main display or it's in your display tank, you didn't tell me if you have a sump or anything underneath, but let's pretend you do. If you have a sump under your tank and you take a flashlight and you shine it down inside the return zone where the return pump is to push water back up, if you see bubbles in there, you're gonna see bubbles in the display tank. You want the return zone to be bubble free. And there's a few methods. Uh, one of the first things people usually tell you is use a filter sock to catch the water pouring in and stop all the bubbles right in their track. That way as it works its way through the zones, it's bubble free for the return pump to send it back up. But you also may discover that your protein skimmer is releasing tiny bubbles into the water and those bubbles are getting in the, the return zone and sending up to the tank. It could be there's a leak in your plumbing where the water is going up and up and into the tank and somewhere in there there's a break in the plumbing to where it's sucking in air and blowing bubbles out. It could even be the lock line, which is the, uh, the black connection, kind of looks like a bumpy caterpillar. And uh, lock lines should be fully submerged. And when part of the knuckles are above water, they can venturi in some air bubbles. So you want to find the source. If you see no bubbles inside the return zone, then it's going to either be in the return pump itself cavitating, or it's going to be somewhere in the line coming up, or it could even be where the water's going into the tank. Somewhere in that connection, you've got a hole that needs to be filled. And once you solve that problem, you may solve your microbubble problem. Uh, Endgame asks, what kind of heater should I use for a 32 gallon tank? I would recommend two 50 watt heaters. That should work out just fine for your size tank. Cause 32 times three is 96 and hundred watts would do just what you need there. Divided by two is two 50 watt heaters. Uh, Rossi asks me, what heater do I use? I'm using the Eheim Jaegers and I've been using that brand of heaters for eight years. And before that I used, oh yeah. Eheim Jaeger, uh, before that they used to be called Ebo Jaeger. And uh, Ebo, I think, went out of business and Eheim bought their model. And those are the ones I use in my tank. Um, okay, here you go, that's a good point. So by growing corals and selling them, you can help pay for your addiction. And that is true. Once your tank is running, you can start selling off some corals and by doing so, earn extra money to buy more things you need, which is test kits and salt and RO filters and uh, fish food and you know, possibly more corals. So that is something nice once the tank is set up. And Neil just did the math on his own system and he said his 120 gallon came up to $42 a gallon. So I'm not too far off in my own math that I did a while back. And, you know, it all comes down to choices because I'm using metal halides. I'm using big pendants and I'm using the same pendants for 10 years. In other words, the reflector, I ha don't have to replace it. I've been using the same one forever. And <laughs> I, the only things I replace now are bulbs and ballasts based on mood. Uh, bulbs, typically I replace a bulb when it doesn't turn on. And... Uh, Sometimes they just don't come on. I think there's a problem in my area and I, we get these brownouts and surges and I think it just kind of destroys some of my gear, unfortunately. I used to have a big problem with that with all my Vortec gear. The uh, power bricks that you plug the Vortec pumps into, I kept burning them up. I mean, I kept contacting Ecotech and said, look, I need another power supply, I need another power supply. And they kept sending them to me and I kept buying them. And I said, what is the deal? Why can't you sell me some good ones? And they said, Mark, this is a really weird situation. We have people out there that will use the same power brick forever. And we got people like you that just seem to go through them like water. And I think it really was attributed to my neighborhood. What's going on with the power surging into my house. It was kind of like doing some weird, you know, those power bricks are international. And by just changing the cord, you can use that brick in Europe. And then you can change the cord and you can use it in America. And I believe that the power bricks were getting stuck between two electrical zones, for lack of a better term. And I remember I had a whole bag full of them. 
And I told Bobby, yeah, all these are bad. And he says, let me take a look at those. And he tested, and he goes, this one's good. This one's good. This one's bad. This one, I'm like, what? What do you mean they're good? They never worked. He goes, no, they're fine. And it's almost like they reset. So I had a few, so I have <laughs> some backups. But you know what? The weird thing is I haven't had to replace power bricks in forever, and I'm still running Vortec pumps in all my tanks. So, like I said, I think there's some weird electrical stuff in my area, unfortunately. I live in an older area. My home is, you know, like 50 years old. <laughs> so, you know, we don't have as clean electricity as I might like. Plus, we have lightning and, you know, old storms we have here. So there's a good chance that something just happens. Oh, I did not mention this. Um, when I talked about buying things, I, I saw it in here, but I didn't say it. But it just occurred to me from what someone mentioned here. You also want to take into consideration, if you're not buying a chiller, some other way to cool your tank, and that might be to have a, a fan of some kind. And that's a tiny little expense, but it's still part of that initial expense of setting up a tank. And, you know, fans can be, you know, 10 to 30 or 40 bucks a piece. So depending what kind you buy. You know, the computer fans, you can get dirt cheap ones that last a little while. You can buy the better ones. Uh, I sell the Ice Cap uh, Smart Fan, and I think those are like $34. And, I mean, they last forever. So that's why I like those, and that's why I sell those. Uh, okay, this is a valid, valid concern. The problem with local fish stores in San Francisco is the extent of pumps that they have are Rio pumps. And the high-end skimmers are sold to Core Life Super Skimmers, so I'm not going to buy their equipment. Fair enough. But you know what? Um, if you cannot buy what you want at that store, I totally get that. And I think that you're 100% right, and I wouldn't even consider it. I, you know, like if I go into a store and there's... In, I've never liked Rio pumps. I, mean, <laughs> I used them in the beginning because they came with my tank, but the Rio 2100 and the 2500 were known tank killers. They literally would explode and leak this black stuff into the water and it would just kill everything. And I did not trust them in my system, so I only used them to mix salt water. And I had one explode in my salt water barrel. Just cooked it. All the water, there was this black stuff on the surface. It smelled like fireworks. And matter of fact, the uh, explosion sound pretty impressive so <laughs> I don't recommend that brand and if that was in my fish store I wouldn't buy it either but I would not go into a store selling the reef octo skimmer ask for a demonstration ask how to build it ask all the stuff and then go buy it somewhere else that, that would be wrong okay that's my point that's what I was trying to get to before but uh, you know there's other things you can always buy and when I travel I tend to go into fish stores because I get taken there and while I'm there I buy something even though I'm traveling. So I'll buy another test kit or I'll buy, um, I bought a cleaning magnet at one store. You know, just a little something to help the economy. Just keep them going so that they're there when you need them because I stopped by. <laughs> and my few dollars helped a little bit too. So that doesn't mean you can't just go buy things online. You definitely can. I'm an online business myself. So there's a dichotomy right there that, you know, I'm trying to overcome. But at the same time, I totally understand the value of being able to drive down the street, walk into a store, talk to them about your problems, have them test your water, uh, and, you know, and buy some things I want today and not wait for it to arrive later. Oh, that's an interesting point here. Thank you, Matt. He was saying that if you're buying someone's used setup, then ask them what part of equipment they didn't like <laughs> so you can decide what's the first thing you're going to upgrade. <laughs> That's, I like that. That's great. Why are you leaving the hobby? What did you not like about this gear? Perfect. Thank you. Let's see. Well, that would be really cool um, to be able to run your entire tank off solar power. Um, smaller tank, definitely doable. Bigger tank, maybe? Depends if you have those Tesla batteries in your garage. But that would definitely be the cooler to go. Um, all right, I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling. There's a lot of chat here, guys. You guys have been really talking a lot. While we're uh, killing time, 
I'm going to show you guys something that I bought for myself for Christmas, New Year's, end of the year, whatever you want to call it. It's in here somewhere. So that is my new toy. I just bought this for myself. Uh, I've got myself in debt for the next six years. But the last vehicle I had, I've had for 15 and a half years. I haven't had a car payment in 10 years and four months. And last night I scheduled my auto pay for the next 71 payments. <laughs> and I was like, ouch! But at the same time, oh my God, it's so awesome. So in case you didn't know what that was besides truck, that's a Toyota Tundra. And I saw an ad for it about three weeks ago. And I said to myself, that's what I want. And so I set everything into motion to make that happen. And by the end of the year, I bought it. So that is my new vehicle to drive around in and to go bring your packages to FedEx and to get packing materials and, you know, Home Depot runs and all the things I do. I'm doing it in that now. So I still need to sell my old vehicle. I kept it because the, the trade-in value was ridiculous. So I will sell that to a human being because my car ran. Uh, my last vehicle is a Ford Explorer. And I had it, like I said, all those years, and it's just now coming up on 148,000 miles. So it's not worn out. And you guys know me, I take care of everything. So I maintained everything on it, anything that had to be repaired or replaced or, or um, maintained, I did. And uh, I used my friend Bobby for a lot of that. Uh, I'd spent a lot of times at his house as we ripped apart <clears throat> axles and put in new bearings and, and lowers and uppers and stuff I don't even understand. But uh, the car's running fine, but at some point it's going to stop. And I said, okay, I'm going to move into a new vehicle. I've been in this one forever. So that uh, was my new present to myself. And I, you know, it's hard to even call it a present when you got to pay so much money for so long. But I decided I needed to do that. And funny uh, thing, I didn't know this. I have good credit, but because I hadn't had a car payment in forever, they looked at me as a risk at first. The computer automatically turned me down. And then when a human being looked at everything, I said, oh no, you're absolutely good to go. And so I was approved. So that was nice. My friend AJ, <clears throat> he was very kind to help me through that whole process because I hate buying cars. And he made it as painless as possible. He answered all my questions and he, uh, he did a lot of the logistics from the back end. So when I actually went to the dealership, I just signed a bunch of papers and left that night with my brand new truck. So that was pretty awesome. Yes, uh, Saltwater Newbie, I did mention RODI. And having an RODI system is very important for a brand new tank. So when you're setting up your new system, the, <laughs> the core of your aquarium is water. I mean, aquarium. So you gotta have good pure water to start with. And if you start off with tap water, you're gonna start off with hair algae <laughs> and other issues. So better to just start with good clean water from the very beginning. Uh, what are my thoughts on a UV sterilizer for a reef tank? Honestly, I've never used one on any of my tanks ever. And the place that they seem to be the most beneficial is on quarantine tanks. So if you set up a quarantine tank and you put a UV sterilizer on that, it could work. But to have it on the reef tank itself to kill anything that crosses that light, good bacteria, bad bacteria, it doesn't care. Whatever's going through, it kills it. There are reasons to have it. Uh, I know some people swear by it for removing spores of algae, for example. Um, and that is a, a viable argument. But I've been in this hobby 20 years. None of my tanks have ever had UV, ever. But I'm setting up a, well, I've been to big tank setups. And with those, they almost always have UV. And I think that's just because their system is so huge, you know, 200,000 gallons, 500,000 gallons, these massive systems, they throw everything out, ozone, UV, uh, you know, uh, they do uh, liquid carbon dosing. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff they do to keep everything just right to avoid issues. So, but I don't really see the need, and I've seen people do it. I can tell you this, it's one more thing you gotta buy, and it's one more thing you have to maintain, and it's one more thing that can break. So. Other than that, it's not detrimental. It's not going to kill your reef. It's not going to be bad. But I haven't seen the need for it. I don't know if that answered your question adequately or enough. 
Rossi, I don't know the answer to that question because like I was saying before, it really comes down to the fish and corals you want to buy. And if you just, let's consider this way. If your average frag is $40, that seems like a nice price, right? Uh, I know frags can be 80, 90, more, you know? But let's just say the average frag was $40 and you needed 10 frags for your tank. That's $400. If you wanted 20 frags for your tank, that's $800. And that's with my average $40 each price. If you are buying frags online, uh, like Reef Pets, I think he runs a successful eBay business and people bid for their frags. You know, and I don't even understand it. I've never done it. You know, I, I see it as I'm scrolling, but I don't really pay attention to it. And some people say, oh, I got this for $5 or $10 because no one bid. But there's others that are spending, you know, a hundred or more on a frag. So you take the entire price of the kit. But let's just say you ordered a frag pack for $250 and you got six corals delivered with free shipping. So you are looking at $250 you spent for six frags. And your tank might hold 40 frags. So there's that. And then fish. Uh, depending what kind of fish you want. You might say, I want a yellow tang. And that could be 70 or $80. You might say, I want a gem tang, that's $1,000. You could say, I want a purple tang, it's $170. You could say, I want a clownfish, but I want this specific clownfish, and those are $100 each. My uh, first two clownfish I bought were called True Perculas, and I bet most of you don't even know what that is, because everyone has also layers these days. But True Percula was an orange clownfish with a white stripe in the middle, with a black line on each side. And Beautiful, beautiful animal. I bought a pair. I think I paid like $56 for both. And I had them together for 12 and a half years. And then for no reason whatsoever, the female died, which made me really upset because uh, she was my first fish I bought. And uh, her mate became a female, you know, because the female was gone. But uh, the true percula was gorgeous back then, and that was my favorite. Uh, another popular fish people love are flame angels, and those sell for about $56. So you see, when you start looking at the cost of each individual fish you like, uh, Royal Grama, Yellow Chorus Wrasse, Pajama Cardinals, Bengais, um, then you can look at, uh, I'm trying to think what other, uh, Six Line Wrasse. I mean, it just starts adding up. And then also, what size is your tank? How much can you actually cram into that tank? How many fish will fit? Healthily. Healthily. You know, not uh, cramming them in to get as, most, as many as you can. That's the funny thing about freshwater, and I know nothing about freshwater. I joke all the time, oh, freshwater. But my, I know nothing. Nothing. I am a saltwater guy. But with freshwater tanks I've seen with my eyes, they're filled with fish. They have lots and lots of fish. And one of the things you will never see in a reef tank, never, ever, never, never, never see, is a big fish with a thousand little babies all swimming next to its body like you see in the freshwater. And actually, I'm not going to lie, that is so awesome to me. That looks so neat. <laughs> we will never see that because that's not how it works in salt water. Those babies, if they get released in the tank, they get destroyed by the pumps and the filters or they get eaten by the other fish because predators. And that's that. Uh, it's actually amazing to me that we have any fish in the ocean. I, I still can't wrap my brain around how there are more clownfish in the ocean because if you've ever seen baby clownfish, they're itty bitty tiny and everything in the ocean is looking for something to eat constantly. And that goes for other fish. I mean, I'm just using clowns as an example, but mandarins, mandarins swim together and then release their sperm and eggs into the water. And somehow that's supposed to turn into a baby mandarin while all the other fish come up and gobble up, literally devour the sperm and eggs that just hit the water. And that's just another one species. There's so many out there and everyone's always looking to eat. They're all watching each other. <laughs> it's horrible. It's like prison rules, you know? <laughs> if the food's available, it's anyone's, you know? It's like, oh my God. So it's, it's kind of amazing to me that uh, anything survives in the ocean and yet they continually do. You know, they must really know how to duck and hide and protect themselves. Um, let's see. I'm just going to, I can't ignore that. I'll be right back. Let me go check something.
thought that was a customer came to my door, but it was the mailman. So he just delivered to me. Something from VCA. Last week, you guys saw me talk and replace the flow accelerators in my tank with the RFG nozzles, which is the random flow generator. So Antonio said, hey, Mark, put them on your website. <laughs> so he sent me uh, a couple of each. So I'm going to add those to my website. And then if one of you or some of you want to buy a few, I have them here on my website, which is kind of neat. Uh, he sells them directly. He just made an offer. He says I could sell them too. So if you were interested and that's something you want to do, you are welcome to do so. Those nozzles are working out really, really well so far. It's been a week. What could go wrong, right? There's no moving parts. But uh, the one thing I've observed uh, is that the anemone that's usually way up high is like pulled way down into the rock work, which is fine with me. That's great. But uh, it's now exposed all the dead skeleton. Of, you know, Remember, I, I put my anemone inside a cage of death so that way it won't go anywhere. And so now I see a lot of the cage, uh, you know, the, the dead skeletons. So that is that. Um, okay. Here's another good piece of advice that the Reef and Recon said. He was saying, buy things that are larger than the system you're starting with because you're going to upgrade later. It's not a bad point. Uh, it's very true. There's certain things you're going to be able to use forever. Our ODI system essentially will last you forever unless you do something like freeze it solid and destroy it, you know, where it just ruptures. But, you know, I, you could use the same RODI system for 10 years or longer. Uh, the protein skimmer that you buy will take care of your tank now. Is it big enough to handle the next size up? You know, can you move it into the next one? That's kind of a nice benefit. Your return pump, will it work on both tanks? The test kits, they work on every tank, so that's perfect. So there's certain things that you will be able to use and reuse, and there's certain things that you will part with. Or maybe you will keep what you used to have because, for example, you start off with a small tank. And listen, guys, small tanks are awesome. I had a 29-gallon for seven years. That was my first tank. And I let it fill up. And once it was full, I said, okay, I'm done. <laughs> and I was like, no, it's time to upgrade. And I was like, no, no, upgrades cost money. And, you know, I ended up upgrading. And, yes, it cost me a lot of money. But at the same time, what you move the livestock out of becomes a quarantine tank or a hospital tank or a, another aquarium that you could put more livestock in that you can't put with the other livestock. You might say, oh, I really love this piece of uh, uh, this, this invertebrate. I really like it, but it doesn't do it doesn't play well with others. So I'll keep this as a single biotope with that critter that I can enjoy. And then I'll have this tank over here to do my normal reef. So you can repurpose things. So the money you're spending, it's not just being wasted. And that that's an important consideration. Uh, something I mentioned a while back, was that if you are really wanting a reef tank and you can't afford it or it's just too much right now or you're not set up for a big tank, even though that's what you really dream of, set up a small one. I did a whole live stream about that. So if you can go back to last year and find that because having a small tank that'll make you happy right now is pretty awesome. And it kind of helps take the edge off when you're really frustrated that you don't have your big dream tank that you want. So, you know, at the very least, set up something small and enjoyable that you can, you know, you can play with and tinker with on a daily basis and that'll really help. And then I was asked, where do you buy your plumbing and acrylic supplies? Um, some plumbing is Home Depot. Uh, Flex PVC is a brand that I like, or a website I like, flexpvc.com. Savco.com was a place I shopped from a lot in the past. Those are pretty much my three sources, sometimes Lowe's. <laughs> it depends on what it is I'm looking for. Um, the acrylic supplies are all gonna come from my acrylic supplier. So I operate out of, you know, there's so many here in the Fort Worth, Dallas uh, area. So I, um, I have a couple of accounts here because, you know, I work with acrylic all day long and uh, I'm building things for customers constantly. <laughs> Brian says credit card debt is real. And that is true. You could literally get yourself in debt with credit cards. Try to be careful with those. I like to look at credit cards as emergency money rather than 
fish tank money. <laughs> Is it advisable to dose ABCD? Well, the company that makes it totally thinks so. Um, I don't actually use ABCD, so it's not a bad thing. It's just a, it's a series of elements that they're doing. I use Prodibio, so it's just a different flavor, right? This coffee is so cold. <laughs> Martin Cho says, that this hobby is more expensive than a drug habit. And it's equally addictive. Uh, the Reef and Recon asked me, what time is it in Holland? Actually, he might have asked someone that's in here. I don't know. Okay, so microbubbles, they obscure your vision and they block light. So that is the downside. Um, they spoil pictures, <laughs> but they don't harm your livestock necessarily. You're not going to see fish floating to the surface because they're full of microbubbles. But we usually don't like them. I mean, think about what people are trying to accomplish with the reef tanks. They're trying to create these absolutely amazing HDR experiences they can share online. And crystal clear water is the goal. Why do you think they're running UV and ozone and, and filter socks and everything to make the water as crystal clear as possible? And then you have all these little bubbles bounce around in there and it ruins the view. So that's why we don't like them. Uh, they're not going to hurt your corals necessarily unless there's a real serious buildup uh, where you start seeing air collecting like bubbles under the branches and then you see the tissue die there because there's just air sitting on the coral. That would be a problem. But small little bubbles, not so much. Gary, welcome to our uh, obsessed hobby. We, we love salt water. So if you're looking to set up a 30 or 40 gallon uh, aquarium, your choices are gonna be varied. I mean, really, it's really hard to answer that question because you're asking, you know, I don't know what your budget is. You're saying, what are, <laughs> what, how can I set a budget for you? I can't dictate what you're going to buy or what you even prefer. You might say, I love green star polyps. I love mushrooms. I love this. It's going to be very inexpensive for you. But if you say, oh, I want SPS and I want uh, clams and I want, uh... but I mean, I saw your question. You said, you know, fish start off and then corals later. You're going to want to set up a tank that can support a reef. So you're going to set up a tank with proper lighting that corals can thrive on. And you're going to need to maintain water parameters for a reef rather than water parameters for fish. Uh, a fish-only system can have lower salinity. Uh, they, they care less about alkalinity and calcium. So a fish-only system is actually simpler to run. Uh, you still have certain basics you have to follow, but you don't have to kill yourself at it. Where with saltwater reefs, the parameters really matter. And so we focus on pretty much every nuance of the tank so that everything in the tank will live and thrive. Wow, I'm so far behind this chat, I had no idea. Uh, ATF in the house, <laughs> welcome. He says that he's looking at $80 a gallon. So it's his pro, and that's not, uh, that's not unreasonable. That is actually doable. And you know, if you buy an ELO setup, the full setup, you're looking around $79 a gallon, I believe it was, and I did the math, or 75 or some high number like that. Hi, Andrea. Uh, let's see. Here's a comment I want you guys to all see. If I only knew then what I know now, I could have saved thousands of dollars. Part of that savings would have come from buying the right products up front instead of trying to go super cheap at first. And that is a huge accurate statement. I, I can't emphasize it enough. I want to leave it on the screen for the rest of the, <laughs> the live stream. <laughs> but yeah, I, I tend to buy higher end gear. And I, I know that's not... I mean, you know, 
just like I chose to buy that truck instead of buying something that's a third of the price or half the price. And others might say, oh, I'd be much happier with such and such, and it would only cost me you know, this much. You can. You can definitely do that. And that's why there's so many different types of cars on the market. That's why there's so many different protein skimmers on the market, so many different light fixtures. There's something for everyone. So you can find something that will cost less, but it may not last as long. And it may get you by for now, and that's okay. But as long as you know up front, you're going to be having to replace it. For example, when I was replacing a part of my calcium reactor every single year for $100, I thought, why do I keep buying this thing? It only lasts 12 months. And so I stopped buying it and I bought the nicer one that lasted me eight years. So spending more on certain products could potentially last longer. That's not always the case. Certain things go wrong, but for the most part, I prefer what you would consider higher end gear. And that's how I set up tanks with higher end gear so they last longer. I didn't even mention in all the purchases, the actual pumps that move water through the display tank. That's not even on this list. Maybe it's further down in there, in this article. Yeah, there's the lighting. There's the equipment in the sump. Um, the other thing that I didn't mention price-wise would be like gyre pumps, Vortec pumps, Nero 5 pumps, uh, Jabo. Uh, you know, all those different ones you put in there for creating flow in the tank. Or maybe you want to do a closed loop, which is where you have water go out and into a pump and back into the tank to create a circle of water at all times. Though That's another expense of part of the initial setup. I think that's the only thing I forgot. Oops. Should have said that 30 minutes ago. I don't know the answer to that question, sorry. So I'm not even going to put it on the screen. <laughs> uh, okay, guys, we have come up on an hour. I feel like I missed so much. Today's Facebook video that I'm going to release will answer a lot of these questions. That will be the follow-up. That'll be this evening. So that will be facebook.com slash Milo's Reef. That's where I post my videos. Usually they're uploaded between 8 and 9 o'clock at night. It takes me a few hours to build that, uh, unfortunately. So I will answer all that. I want to talk to you about 2019 for a minute before we wrap up because it's a new year and it's nice to have new goals. Um, something I want to do for the channel that I have not done before and that's why I thought it's a good idea. And feel free to give me your feedback. I, I think this would be a nice series. Um, we already do live streams. <clears throat> and uh, I'm always looking to your comments for topics you like to discuss. And, uh, you know, last year we did basically 50 live streams. We talked about 50 things. I don't know if we can do it two years in a row. But, you know, we'll do our best. You know, we might have to recycle a couple of topics. But a series that I thought would be really nice to do. I documented every facet of building the 400 gallon um, when I set it up in 2010, 2011. And I did huge write-ups on the entire process. Most of you never read those uh, or never saw the pictures. A lot of people are newer in the hobby and you know they weren't around eight years ago when I was doing all this. So what I'm planning to do is go to my archives, look up those pictures and those, those, uh, those blogs, and I'm gonna go ahead and do <clears throat> a series of videos that'll be like midweek videos where you're going to see how the 400 gallon was built from the ground up. So it'll be something, you know, some kind of title with episode one, episode two, episode three, episode four, until we run out of episodes. And I think that would be a really good way to get that valuable information on the web because, you know, unless you're knowing what to Google for, you may not come across those blog entries. And there's a lot of good, useful, hands-on information there. So what I'm planning to do is take the pictures, and take the, the body of text, and uh, create individual videos of each one of those entries that I felt would be the best beneficial uh, video for you guys. And what I'm thinking, it, you know, it's not going to be like a slideshow. It's not going to be story time with Mila. <laughs> I mean, I will definitely 
uh, flesh it out and add more information. But these will be edited videos, and I know a lot of you guys like edited. And I think it'd be a really cool thing because we'll be starting from ground zero when I drew my dream tank way back in, in the middle of 2010 to what you see today, you've actually enjoyed my, my tank and you, you're, you're tuning in every week and you, you never saw the process of that build. And so I thought, I'm gonna do that. And that way that valuable information can be put out there for you guys and you can actually watch it in order and you could binge watch it, you know, like you do on Netflix. And you know, you could say, oh, I'm not gonna watch any of that. I'm gonna save it for later. And then you can actually watch, you know, four, six, eight episodes in a row and we can work our way through. Wouldn't it be funny if there's so much in there that it's season one, season two, season three. Yeah. Uh, speaking of binging, I uh, have been binging The Magicians, Magicians, <clears throat> which is a, a sci-fi show that has been really, really good. It's been, I found it on Netflix and I'm almost done with season two. Super good show. I don't, what do you guys binge? What's, what's the latest thing you've been watching? You know, because you, know, you just came off this holiday break and maybe there's something you watch. I'd love to know what you are seeing. Maybe it's something I haven't seen yet that I'd be interested in. Other than that, I hope you guys have a great weekend. Please test your water today. Clean your skimmer cups today. And I will see you guys online, and I'll answer a lot of these questions that got missed tonight on Facebook. Bye, guys.